ingredients which are important. You've got to check the box. You've got to adhere to the statutes and the regulations. But it's more about the implications of that regulation and compliance on the lives of people. Uh, and the disparate impact on gender, on race, and other populations. We have to be thinking about that as we innovate and as we regulate. We also have to be thinking about ethical issues. That's something near and dear to my heart, that you can't just put out technology, put out innovation, put lawyers, put innovators, and uh, put business people in the mix and hope they'll make the right decisions. We always have to be thinking about our moral compass and thinking about the ethical implications of all that we do. Um, one of the things that happened in the last couple of months uh, that was sad to us uh, was the passing of Michael Chaharis. Uh, Michael Chaharis was a great benefactor um, and visionary of the Chaharis uh, Health Law Institute. And he spent most of his life in the pharma, uh, in the pharma industry as an entrepreneur, as a lawyer, and somebody who really saw that the future was in this marriage between technology and health. And so he would be very proud uh, to see this uh, symposium come to fruition. And, and we're going to certainly share that with his family and with the foundation. And as a dean, I'm particularly proud of the collaborative aspects of this symposium. So we have, uh, as you can see around the room, you have the student leaders who have been very, very involved in the planning and the implementation of the symposium. And we have the, the journals and the institutes collaborating, really, I think, for the very first time at the ground level for a full symposium. And that's, and that's really wonderful. And we see the collaboration at the level of the faculty, uh, Wendy Epstein, uh, uh, and Maggie Livingston and Max Halveston all working together to making sure that this project is one uh, that is collaborative and inclusive. Um, and, uh, and also the executive directors who have been working very, very closely, Kate Shostak, uh, Eli Gutyatov, and the whole team that's worked together to bring this to reality. So I'm very happy to kick this off and want to spend most of the time with the speakers and all that they have to say. And I think what they've just said to me, which is really important, is ask questions, engage, so that we can have real progress in these issues and have a real conversation that moves the ethical and human aspects forward as well as the technology. So thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sydney Mayer. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Healthcare Law. Um, first off, I want to thank our professors, uh, Professor Epstein, uh, Shostak, and Helveston for working so hard to um, ensure a great turnout, to ensure some wonderful speakers, and I just want to thank the fellows as well for uh, coming out. I also want to thank Brian Eckert, who was our symposium director, working so hard. Um, so our first speakers are Ms. Dima Elisa and Dr. Neelam Agarwal. Uh, Dima is a CEO and founder of VizMed 3D, a biomedical design and consulting firm that has emerged as the leader in 3D uh, biomedical visualization and printing in personalized medicine. She uh, was named the Chicago Tribune's Blue Sky Vault's Top 100 Entrepreneurs in Chicago. She, prior to startups, she held numerous positions at NutraSuite in international marketing, new business ventures, and M&A. Dima presently uh, chairs the STEM Steering Committee, and she serves on the World Business Chicago Advisory Council for Manufacturing. Um, and Dr. Neelam Agarwal is the co-leader of the Rush University Medical Center Alzheimer's Disease Center Clinical Care. Um, and a professor of neurological sciences at Rush. Uh, she is a population health neurologist and clinical researching, researcher specializing in aging, dementia, and strokes. She is an associate professor and faculty member of the Department of Neurological Sciences and the Rush's, Rush's Alzheimer's Disease Center. She is a principal investigator for multiple NIA and industry-sponsored Alzheimer's disease clinical trials and is a director of research at the Rush Heart Center for Women. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Jim and Lisa and Dr. Neela Magwell. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you uh, to Paul. This is an incredible opportunity for us as uh, non-legal folks to come in and share a little bit of our passion, a little bit of our vision, and hope for the future. Uh, we partner together to bring the medical side and the innovative uh, entrepreneurial side of 
healthcare to, to come together and really try to bring about change, bring about change and awareness around a subject that's near and dear to our hearts. Uh, the world, as, as we have experienced it, has been governing to a level of averages for women. What do I mean by that? Averages that, that benchmark who we are and what we are prescribed and ascribed in terms of our own uh, definition as, as human beings. So we get treatments that are averaged on a male benchmark. We get designed clothing and, and other uh, devices based on a male mindset or a male uh, vision and, and purpose. So today we're going to share with you uh, some of our findings and our collaboration that came together out of an organization initially where we met uh, Women in Bio, where I serve as the Vice Chair and Neelam serves as the uh, MAPS uh, Chair, which is mentoring. So as our uh, respective positions uh, came together, we discovered and uncovered uh, this opportunity to really merge together around uh, the subject of uh, sex and gender disparities uh, for women in, in terms of health care. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Neelan to uh, kick us off today. Thank you. All right, so I'm a neurologist by training, so I'm going to be very structured as, as I can in this. Uh, presentation. First thing is trying to make sure I get the devices right. Um, so one of the things that you know, Dima um, and I, um, I'm going to use actually we use both. Yeah, just use yeah. Okay. So a couple things we have to just talk about disclosures. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, Dima has uh, no disclosures or conflicts uh, for for the purposes of this presentation. Um, as Dima kind of already set this up a little bit, we wanted to bring to you today some information about sex and gender considerations and what's happening in the field. And what, what I mean in the field, what's happening in medicine right now. There has been a surge of interest in sex and gender considerations in, in medicines, whether it be treatments, whether it be pharma, whether it be clinical trials. And it seems to be permeating through all different levels of medicine. So from where you're at, as we go through this presentation, I want you to think about what we're saying. How does it apply to you? Where does it apply in what you're doing? Because I really feel that it will apply in some way, shape, or form. And also think about what would you want to know more about? Because this field is really shaping and changing as we speak. There are different things coming in that we never even considered before. So the first thing is knowledge about sex and gender differences. So here are some stereotypes. And just think about these. Over an argument, why do men never remember and women never forget? Why won't men ask for directions? Why do women always want to talk about the relationship? Why can't men see that something's bothering me as a woman? Okay, these are stereotypes that we have. We still have more questions. Now coming into a medical, drilling down a little bit on a medical perspective. Why do men die earlier with certain diseases? Why are there more spontaneous abortions if you're an ex-wife, if you're a male? Why do men have four to five times more develop, developmental disabilities than women? We see this, okay, in medicine. Why do adolescent males die more than females in accidents and suicides? It's not enough to just say we have statistics on this. The question should be, why? We have to get comfortable asking why. And that's something that unfortunately, as we go through our training, we, we stop asking why, and it's just put out there. So I want you to keep thinking, why? And these are some of the questions. And the last one is, why do men react to depression with alcoholism and abusive behavior compared to women? Okay. So some of you will say, well, this is what the deal is. <laughs> we have a one switch for the guys, and we've got all these multiple knobs and switches for the women. The point of the slide is there are differences. We are, you know, basically women are not little men. I hear that phrase all the time, okay? And we have different things operating at different levels, and you have to start to understand what is operating at a different level and how does that matter. 
So before we get into this talk, two definitions that are key, sex and gender. You may not even have thought that about the difference. And I, probably if I did a, a questionnaire for you ahead of time, what's the difference between sex and gender? You'd be like, well, I kind of know. Sex, yeah. You know, sex is male, female. And what about, what's gender then? These are important concepts because this is now shaping how we're collecting data, what we're collecting, what the research is looking at. So sex is a biological variable. And it's really defined by your DNA. That's it. XY, XX, simple. Gender is the social, cultural, and psychological traits linked. Okay, And I think it's an important thing to remember about this because guess what? The gender context can change, right? Because the social context can change. And the biggest thing to remember is that they interact. Huge. They do not work in isolation. Sex and gender. Not just sex and not just gender. Sex and gender because there is a big interaction. So now that I've told you that, I'm hoping you're thinking, OK, title of the slide. Why does it matter? How does this work? What's the, what's the point? What's the point? The point is, when you start thinking about sex and gender, you now start to look at policies and treatments. And traditionally in medicine, traditionally in medicine, things have been gendered. We have done treatment plans for patients based on some of the gender, so the sex is there, but the gendered component comes in, okay? Um, understanding the gender, what makes someone come later. So for example, women tend to come to the emergency room later than men for heart attacks. Okay? And it's always been, well, what is that? Well, women <coughs> tend to not, they put off their signs and symptoms. They have kids to take care of. They're doing something different. We're bringing in the social context of what's surrounding that versus, versus, is there something different in a woman's heart or her perception of pain that is normally experienced with a heart attack to get her to come into the ER? So already you can see what's happening here when you start looking at statistics in medicine, what the disease rates in medicine are, acute care in medicine, things become gendered. The other thing is individuals tend to view the world through the lens of their own attitudes. And what does it mean to be a man and a woman? And right now, we're seeing a huge shift in medicine with various different groups self-identifying. And frankly, we haven't done a good job about this. I have more people coming up to me at work and saying, Dr. A, you know what? Where do I put this down? I'm transgender. I don't know. I don't know where to put this down. Where do I fit in? How do I fit in? The doctors don't know right now, even transgender health don't really know what are, the, what, what, what are we treating, how do we treat, what kind of guidelines do we look at. So it's really coming to form, and it's also how people are perceiving who they are between a man and a woman. And all of this then, again, the why is policies and programming. Policies and programming, how do we incorporate this? So before we started, I was speaking briefly to your dean, and I was telling her that in medicine, we've known about these issues, okay? So I'm a, I'm a woman, obviously. Um, I'm a neurologist. I see both men and women patients. I do a lot of Alzheimer's work. And we have noticed difference. Any practicing doctor will tell you there are differences between men and women, not only with, with diseases and, and issues with health, but also how we communicate with patients differently. We communicate differently with women and men. By the way, women speak way more than men do. Yes, it's a fact. Yes, we know that. And the, the bottom line on this is our left temporal lobe is larger in, men, in women than in men. Temporal lobe and our area for language is, is bigger. So the brain is showing changes, OK? So in medicine, we know that there are differences occurring. But we haven't got any traction in trying to figure out more on a deeper level what these differences are until the NIH, the Office of Women's Health, and the FDA now have sought to really address this. Because it's coming to a head about all these differences, and we have a very superficial understanding of what that means. The why has been asked over the years, but the why has not been answered. And the reason why the why has not been answered is that we haven't had governmental bodies come down, frankly, and say, you better ask the why, and you better show that you were looking for the why. That's the key point here, okay? So 
Here's what's been happening. The NIH Revitalization Act, 1993. This is something that anyone who writes grants, as myself, and everyone who does this will understand. This has now been on grants forever. You have to have a section on a grant about women and minorities. You have to talk about why you are going to be including or not including women and minorities. And it's basically based on these premises. Women and minorities have to be included in all clinical research. And if you don't, you better have a good reason why not. Now, there are some huge, huge studies right now that are all women's studies. The Women's Health Initiative is one of them that comes to mind, okay? There are some other large studies with men only. You can make the case, I'm going to be doing prostate work, I don't need to be looking at women. Got it, we get it. But the thing is, for the majority of the research, you have to have a good case of why you're not going to include women and minorities, okay? And what are the issues? And it's now in every single grant application. It's been there forever. The second thing is that the NIH wanted was the trial has to be designed to permit valid analysis of the different effects in women versus men. This is where we have fallen short, short, short. I can't even tell you how short we've been followed. We do not do this routinely. I'm in a clinical trial business, and I can tell you all the time I'm asking, what are the differences between women and men in these trials? What are the differences with the drugs? And the answer traditionally has been, here's the answer, we are doing internal analyses. Oh, well, are they going to be out there to look at? And we have not seen them. It's always the internal analyses that are going on. And it's coming to a problem now because we're having issues with medications, side effects of medications, and we only find out after the medication has got FDA approval and then put in a lot of people, frankly, and then suddenly we have an issue with the med. And then the third thing is cost. Cost is not allowed as an acceptable reason for exclusion. You're gonna sit there and say, are you kidding, really? Cost, yes. There have been cases where it has said that it's too expensive to include both. It is too expensive to include minorities, underserved populations. It's costing a lot for recruitment. Recruitment and retention are two things right now in medicine that are huge, and they were always behind in recruitment and retention. Very few studies have ever finished on time, have ever finished on budget, and have ever really hit their recruitment, their recruitment goals. It's always been an issue for getting, especially clinical trial studies. So the NIH put this through, and then the NIH then said, okay, that's cool. We're doing this now with people. Let's go down to the bench researchers. This is the point of the slide. Came out in nature. And basically, Dr. Clayton really pushed for this. She says, we're focusing all these things on grants, NIH grants that are looking at humans, but we're not looking at the cells, and we're not looking at the tissue. The bench researchers who are using tissue, not only from humans, but from animals. So this kind of sex in the cell type of thing, every cell has a sex. And it sounds like, yeah, of course, but it's not, it's been elusive for many people to really take that to heart. And basically, it was only until Francis Collins from the NIH said, we have really got to start looking at this and mandating that we report that every sex has a, every cell has a sex. Okay? Up to this point, it was not done. Okay? And if you look at bench research, if you look at papers from bench research, very rarely will they say where the cells came from. Or even if they talk about rats and mice, very rarely were they saying years ago, and even now, you don't see the female rat or the female mouse. And this has been an issue that has been just, well, it's not important. The science is the science. The science is a science that really shouldn't matter. And the point is, yeah, it, it could and it may start looking at it. So we've had two key things. From the population level, from humans, you have to do things from NIH perspective, but now the NIH is hitting bench research, okay? Came from a meeting, and I can tell you the scientists at the meeting, they still were not on board. Yes, it's mandated now, but you know what? They were saying things like, do we really have to go ahead? Science is science. It should be It should be irrelevant. It doesn't matter. We're not looking at hormones. We're not looking at something different. Why should we do this? And now it's mandated. So if you think of sex as a biological variable, just remember the two things. It's important. 
sex is important, it has profound influence on the daily life, and also in the past the scientists thought that physiological processes were not um, really impacted. So, more questions for you to think about. I want you to think about these questions. If you think about sex and gender research, there are three different prongs. One is coming from your DNA. The other is from the drugs. By you not asking questions, by me not asking questions as a physician who does trials and clinically treats people, I'm often wondering, what am I missing? And here's the rub right now. The public is asking questions. I love it when my patients come in and ask me these questions. They're Googling right in front of me. It's great. You know why? Because they're pulling information out there. And right now they're pulling precision medicine. This is what they're pulling. And these are the things that we have been very, very slow in the field to really step up and start answering some of those questions. A lot of physicians have not been trained to look at these types of issues or think about these issues. And frankly, it's not being taught in the medical schools. The medical school curricula is trying to change, but it's a slow process, like with any other curricula process. Anyone who's worked with curricula knows what I'm talking about, but we are not really looking at any of these issues by, or thinking, what are we missing by not including sex and gender? What harm are we doing by not including sex and gender? I'm going to drill down even deeper. What harm are we doing by not even looking at race ethnicity? This is an issue that is really important. Not all drugs are metabolized the same in different ethnic groups. They're not. And yet, if you want to find out which ones are metabolized differently in different ethnic groups, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time. Because not every field has been up on that. Cardiology is one of the fields that has been really up on race ethnic differences in, in medications, cardiac meds, metabolism, etc. But the other fields have been very, very slow. So if you're looking to find information, sex and gender differences, um, also race ethnicity, cardiology will be the place that you're going to find some pretty cool information about this because they've been very forward thinking. So. The NIH, as I said, was really pushing now for sex and gender as it comes to the cell. The NIH now is looking at experimental designs. How are you developing your experimental design to include this? And this is where the pushback has come back from the scientists. Meaning, I'm developing a design based on my scientific knowledge of what I want to look at. I am not going to have to redo it to adapt it to this kind of a process that you want me to for sex and gender considerations. And that's an ongoing debate, but it's getting a little bit quieter in that arena. Okay, so here is kind of the strengthening the science. This is how the NIH posed this, that we're doing sex to strengthen science. We're looking for male-female differences. We're looking that sex is a fundamental biological variable. The NIH got involved, and then the outcome. When researchers consider sex as a biological variable, the NIH will continue to deliver rigorous science. Okay? So this was their roadmap. January 2016 was the day, actually the 1st of January, was the day that the new law was mandated. So every grant application, every research application coming in after Jan 2016 now had to basically talk about sex and gender explicitly in the proposal of how we're looking at this. Now typically in grants, you'll have a section that says innovation. What is your innovation? And this is relatively new. Or what is your public health impact? And again, for, for researchers, for some researchers, this was so over the top, they didn't understand this. What are you talking about? What do you mean innovation? Of course it's innovative. This is science. No. How is this impacting public health? How is this impacting public? How is this doing something for a greater good? Okay. Now we're having in these grants, how are you looking at sex and gender considerations? And more importantly, your data that you're going to collect, you tell me how are you going to analyze that data? Are you going to stratify it out? Are you going to do men versus women? What kind of models are you going to run? What kind of statistical analysis? And you can imagine that that buildup for that kind of thing caused a lot of people to think, gosh, that's just adding costs. Remember that first slide about costs? That costs can't be a reason why you won't do it? Well, that has come into some discussions. It's adding more costs. Okay. So this came out in 2016. And then here's what happened. 
not only did it come from NIH, the Office of Women's Health then got involved in this issue because realizing NIH put the mandate down, now the office can put the mandate down. And the Office basically of Women's Health is really important because it's really looking at women's health issues through policy, science, and outreach. It's the multi-pronged approach from the Office of Women's Health. And it also, of course, advocates for women and men, but it, women and men, because again, we need both, okay? We need women and men, but mostly in clinical trials is where the Office of Women's Health is really doing a lot of work in sex and gender um, differences. The Office of Women's Health works very closely with the FDA, okay? The FDA and these offices work together, and the FDA basically wants to look at couple things when it comes down to not just food and drug. We often forget the food from the FDA. So food, nutrition, these kinds of things are very important to the FDA. We're always focusing on, excuse me, on the drug issue. But it's really now encouraging sex and gender differences in clinical trials. The FDA is driving this now when it comes to anything coming for a clinical trial. So right now I'm involved in a lot of clinical trials. These trials, if they're going to go to FDA to get drug approval, they are now going to be saying, what were your sex and gender differences? Did you look at the data? Did you stratify the data? What is the data showing? Not just internally now. It's not going to be an internal type of analysis. It's going to be, what are you going to report? What is going to come out in a clinical trial paper to say this drug is good for this? What were the sex and gender considerations? The other thing the FDA is going to talk about is medical devices. This is a huge void in what is happening. We do not have enough information on medical devices between men and women. And it is shocking. Dima will talk about this with you. It is shocking to me that we have not really looked at this in a methodical way. So I'm throwing it out here. Pacemaker. Have you ever thought that there may be a difference for a woman and a man to have, could have a pacemaker placed? You would think maybe there'd be something different. It's not always about size, okay? Downsize it for a woman, upsize it for a guy. It's more than that, okay? No one has really been looking into these issues, and it's incredible that we've come this so far with technology and have not really had a structured way of looking at devices. So here's some things about the FTA. I want you to keep this in mind because it has a lot to do with sex, age, gender, race, socioeconomic is coming in, but the FDA is very interested in these pieces. And there are a couple of things that the FDA has put forward on how to address this. There are different ways the FDA is looking at things, whether it be guidance, whether it be regulatory research. This is your area where you're going to be because the FDA is putting these mandates down of how they're investigating things. It is very labor intensive. But the other thing that they're doing is really looking at action plans, an FDA action plan where they have some um, minutes, if you will, or you can go to Congress or you can do a public testimony. I'm going to show you two slides about the state that we're in right now. Okay, This is the state we're in right now. This slide came from science. Take a look at the underreporting of sex of animals now, animals in basic science. And these are across the journals in medicine, okay? The different kinds of journals. Physiology, pharmacology, and endocrinology, two big compl complicated areas where you have hormones interacting with multiple organs. Physiology in general, all the different organs acting together. And pharmacology, which is basically drugs, how that interacts. Take a look at really what is being reported in the literature when it comes to the sex of the animal. The majority of these studies are coming from male animals. There's not even a balance between male and female animals. So what does that mean? It means that we are gender biased right now, and excuse me, sex biased right now, where we're only reporting this from a male animal. Now you're going to say, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is that if you don't have equal numbers of female rats to male rats in an experiment, and then when you come up with the result, you really don't know if it's working the same thing in a female. This is the state right now. We're trying, you can see some of the other specialties are really trying to move the needle, okay, and to see what's happening here when it comes to both female and male. And then look at my, my area. Okay, neuroscience, we have a lot, still with male, but we have a lot of 
unspecified immunology, which is incredible to me. Immunology, the antibodies, all that is really unspecified. They're not even specifying in the literature what they're looking at. It's just not even there. And the papers are getting published. Here's another one. Minority number of articles reporting data on women by year. Now this has been updated, and I hate to tell you this, nothing's changed. It's not changed. We have a more updated from 2014. But look at this. No women data in these articles that are coming through in the medical arena, the medical research arena. No women data. There was a spike, basically, if you will, where the red, you know, women data was being reported in 1999, huge push by the NIH, and then it started to spike again in different areas, but still we're not having data being reported, okay? The thought, you know, here's the thing, you should be thinking, well, why is that? I'm telling you all this stuff, because nothing has been basically enforced. We have all these ideas, but we're not enforcing it. So the FDA now has had a couple things that they're looking at, and the FDA just held um, a meeting just this past two weeks ago, open public comments about gender, sex and gender, and how we're going to do data collection and why it's important, what are the impediments. But this is really what they're looking for right now, action plans, and we'll have these resources for you. But you need to know about this because they are the drivers behind making this data become available, making people really figure out how to handle things, okay? And how to do it when we're in a lab or we're in a hospital situation. Now one of the things that I alluded to initially was that in medical school education, we are not being taught, and I, I, I mentor students and I can tell you they're not really being taught about sex and gender considerations. And you know, intuitively you're gonna say, well that's where you should go with it. You should take all this and start it as people are in training and people should be learning about this. It's not. It's not being put forward, and this is a big issue we're having. So there's another pipeline right now that is really trying to move this through the medical school. Remember, every cell has a sex, and if you look at the X chromosome, we have up to 1,000 to 2,000 genes are located on the X chromosome, and frankly, on the Y chromosome, we've got less than 50 genes. So the, thing, the, the majority of the genes that are being activated or inactivated are coming off of an X chromosome. The Y chromosome is very, very, very focused on what it's doing. So you can imagine now that if you have XX, you're going to have different genes being upregulated, downregulated, so that can impact how diseases may proceed. Here is a, just a picture of all the different organ systems we know that have sex and gender differences, but sex disparities. And you can see these are, these are big organ systems, okay? Cardiovascular, the brain, autoimmune, hepatic, musculoskeletal, kidney. This is known. We know this. We've seen this. And what's happening, though, is the drilling down of what it means to have these differences in presentation, differences in outcomes, differences in responding to treatments, etc., has not been discussed. There is a curricula right now called the sex and, it's basically called the sex and gender health curricula. It came out of Texas Tech, and it came out of all this background information. Dr. Jenkins is a physician down there, works a lot with the American Medical Women's Association, which I'm their chief diversity officer. We have really worked with her and her team. There's this curricula right now in Texas that they are putting through the medical school to really teach sex and gender considerations. The first of its kind here in the US. I was shocked to go to a meeting in October at the Mayo Clinic and listening to this, which was fabulous, and then having a researcher from the Charité Hospital in Berlin, Germany, get up on stage and show the whole medical school curriculum, four years, every single module class had a sex and gender component to it. If you want to see a bunch of doctors be embarrassed sitting in an audience, you should have been at that meeting. It was silence. We had 110 medical, medical school personnel there, just silence. He left the stage, Karolinska Institute came up on the stage, director there showed their slide of their medical school curricula, sex and gender considerations were being implemented. They left the stage, Canada came up on the stage from Ottawa, they had sex and gender considerations in their medical school curricula. It was astounding to see this. So 
when Texas Tech got up, got up on the stage, people perked up a little bit. And now we are trying to promote this curriculum through the medical schools. So we have a lot of these issues right now about how to do implementation. It's not been easy, okay? But we're going to talk about these current challenges in the research world. And I'm going to hand this over to Dima right now. But I hope from this background you can see where we've, where we've been, where we've come, the governmental agencies that are moving this along. And then the last piece is the medical school curricula, which we are tackling as we speak. That sex and gender curricula, we will be rolling out at Rush at the Heart Center for Women. All the trainees coming through the Heart Center for Women are going to have to take modules in that curricula so they can understand heart disease, but other areas such as osteoporosis, addiction, depression, you name it, we have it. So Dima, I'm going to bring this over, let her talk about some initiatives we've done here in Chicago. But again, as you hear her speak, why? You want to be thinking about why. What else do we know? Why? Because this is a time to really start to formulate where we're going to go with this. Feels kind of cloistered behind this uh, podium. So uh, Neelam and I are both used to kind of walk in the room and, and kind of uh, freewheeling it. But uh, so, so we've got a problem, right? I mean, this is a problem. Would anybody say this is not a concern or a consideration as you move through life to feel as a woman that you are just simply dictated to? You're, you're an average, you're an average man. That's kind of how I feel, and I, I know, I'm many things, but average is not one, and a man is not the other. And so, this has caught my personal passion. And, and to really, I, I, I frankly didn't really consider the fact that our healthcare system, that our innovation system, our, our you know, technology, that I've been part of for many, many years, hasn't even really thought about the fact that I'm different, that you're different. But today, precision medicine is the, the key that is really culminating a lot of thinking and a lot of action around the individual. In the technology world where I come from, I have embraced 3D biomedical printing as a way to really realize that each of us is, is different and putting tools in doctors' hands that help them see through and recognize and discover things before they go into surgery because each patient is as different on the inside as they are on the outside. And so that kind of mindset, that kind of consideration on the front end of things is really where we have a responsibility together to help advise and create that level of awareness. So. Wow, this is our backyard of Chicago. Innovation, integration, coordination, research, health, technology, fashion, everything across the continuum of business and health is happening here in Chicago. And so our responsibility is to try to get some penetration, some awareness, bring out those groups and, and get them in some way to understand that there is a new checkbox in town and it needs to be recognized. And that checkbox is really having to do with, with the gender and sex considerations. If you're not thinking up front and before you design software, if you're not thinking about how you prescribe and, and evaluate your patients, if you're not putting forth the effort to at least vet and, and think about designing clothes for transgender or male or female. And you know, even uh, there's, there's a, an anecdotal story that, that was shared with us about women designing clothes that are far easier for accommodating a, a, a breast pump or that, that need for, for um, women to have some level of decorum in a professional setting. How do you give them that, that psychological comfort? And so it's beyond just the physical. It's also the social, the psychological, 
thinking that we have to put into place to, to factor in the differences that, that are there and are relevant and are present. And it's, it's incumbent on us as the innovators of healthcare or technology to continue to bring that in and raise that level of awareness. So what have we done? In our partnership, we have brought forth um, a, con a consortium of, of ideas and individuals uh, through a program called iGiant uh, that was started at the White House and carried through uh, Stanford. And Neelam, you're welcome to share. This is, this is really Neelam bringing this idea to our organization at Women in Bio. And, and helping us to really um, bring it to a whole new level. So a couple of things about, I'll speak up. So a couple of things about the iGiant program that you should know. I, I'm going to encourage you to go on uh, and Google it. It came from the White House, but really what it was, it was an innovation technology kind of program that went across all different business units, across all themes, so retail, technology, transportation, energy, everything. And it was looking at, frankly, how technology is impacting all these areas, including healthcare, but also focusing on the effect of sex and gender of women. And how is it affecting women? Because if you look at the data, women are using technology at some points uh, more than men do for different things that we are trying to manage. The iGiant program approached the American Medical Women's Association which I'm a member, to talk about how is this impacting women physicians, but also the patients that they take care of. So the AMWA was the driving force for the iGiant to come here in Chicago, and this is what Dima will be talking to you more about, but that's what, that's what you see AMWA up there. And then we partnered, me partnered with Dima at Women in Bio to bring in the women in bio sector for life sciences and pharma. Exactly, and so the Women in Bio is an organization that champions women in business in healthcare and other life science uh, industries and, and positions, and it really is dedicated to helping mentor and sponsor and, and elevate their skills, awareness, networking, and create visibility. And I think that's, that's really uh, the, the key here is that we need to elevate the visibility of our gender, our sex, and look at how it impacts everything from drug development, which, you know, finding out now, looking back at it, that all the drugs that we're taking are predominantly based on male mice or male subjects. It, it's no wonder that, you know, growing up, uh, my mother would tell me, hey, you really need to take just half that dose. And I thought, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But in fact, as I look back on it, my mother was right. There is a difference. We are different. And, and we need to celebrate the differences, but even more so, we need to get them recognized in a way that's meaningful and that translates into our individual personas. And so uh, 3D printing of, of pills, for example, will come at some point to be formulated to your precise body. And that's the dream that I'm, I'm living for. So how do we bring that forward? And, and it really has to do with starting a dialogue, which we've, we've really shepherded through the iGiant program and then what we're calling Shy Giant here in Chicago, is to create and continue a series of roundtables. And those roundtables assemble some of the, the greatest thought leaders, not only across Chicago's innovation ecosystem, but across the country and even beyond uh, borders in, in Canada and so forth. And so these multidisciplinary experts will inform, will become aware, and will help to catalyze this dialogue uh, to recognize that there is bias, unconscious or otherwise. There is bias, and there are implications. And we can do better, and we can do better in the equation of value-based outcomes, which is what medicine is being measured against. So if you're not proving that you're going to improve health or reduce cost or somehow improve patient uh, outcomes, uh, you're not going to be a factor in the healthcare ecosystem. So just, just briefly, this was a, a recap of, of our first roundtable here in Chicago, and it brought together and was sponsored by 
um, some firms you may be familiar with, like McDermott, uh, Will and Emery. Uh, they're a, a local firm that's actually national, but they're helping us to drive this across the country, and they'll be helping us to carry forward uh, a series of these roundtables. So, so, so you lawyers do have, um, or future lawyers, have a great role and a great responsibility to help us um, elevate that awareness, because you're eventually going to be the ones helping reconcile, resolve, or protect some of our domain knowledge, some of our thinking uh, in, these, in these areas. Uh, whoops. So some of the, the folks um, that, that came and participated had to do from, came from Matter, the, um, the health tech incubator. If you're not familiar with it, I invite you to come visit us and we can share a lot more about what we're doing and how the innovators are are uh, participating in these kinds of things. But every entrepreneur at Matter isn't really thinking about sex and gender. And, and there are implications and there are factors and that's what Neelam and I uh, aspire to uh, kind of unveil in a, in a thoughtful process with our dialogue and, and the roundtables. Uh, these are some uh, not only doctors, healthcare litigators, but also entrepreneurs. So uh, the, the ecosystem and, and Dr. Annabelle Boltman from Rush, who runs the Women's uh, Health Center, is a, a is that the Heart Center, Heart Center um, has done a lot of work around the cardiovascular uh, disease and uh, differences, deltas for women. Uh, some of the other firms, Nixon Peabody, uh, Janet is a recognized IP attorney, um, and these are people you may want to consider connecting with and, and coming to our next roundtable and participating with. But we also have um, community leaders, innovators, that, that really are out there in the trenches and, and have definitively come up with some, some nuggets of wisdom that they, from their experiences, have, have shared. So, it's probably not a secret, and it's probably not something new that when more women are dying from cardiovascular deaths than, than men. And I think that's a pretty uh, important distinction. So as Neil said, we have to ask ourselves why. What is it? Is it the fact that, you know, for those that get the pacemakers, it's the wrong size or kind? I mean, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. We need to ask the questions before we can get the answers. But there is a preponderance of scenarios just like this that uh, dictates and, and really recommends uh, further investigation and, and awareness. So, Deem, I just want to make a comment about this uh, because Dr. Goldman is very vocal at this eye giant um, discussion about women dying more from heart disease. So the thinking is, Maybe thinking, all right, well, maybe they're not coming in soon enough to the ED or the emergency room, okay? But here's what happens. You don't come into the emergency room where we can do something, or the symptoms are so vague, you may not get the treatment, you may not actually get the intervention that we want. So therefore, we don't know if that intervention is working, not working, we don't even know how to develop a new intervention because you're not showing up because you're not coming. So I want you to start thinking about the pipeline down it, and, and do your little map down the road of what, what it means. What it means is the devices are, not, are now not being made for women because they're not there to have the devices be put in in a timely manner. This can be translated across all things in medicine, meaning if you don't understand why it's not happening, outside of the social context, is it a pain context? That's, a, that's an argument, that women don't feel pain the way men feel pain. Men, heart attack, the picture is crushing pain on the chest, elephant on the chest. Women, heart attack, we get back pain. We get back pain. Well, you talk to any woman anywhere, they're going to tell you about back pain. It's like a chronic thing for a lot of people. So that's what we need to be thinking about when you read these takeaways and understanding this especially with medicine, down the road it's impacting in a big way. It's hitting people in a big way. And we haven't really put the process together yet. Exactly. So some of the other takeaways that, that we learned from this um, first series, it's actually the fourth round table, but the first one here for Shy Giants. And you know, we, we learn about the differences of, of men and women uh, and, and how things are 
impacted. So we learned that, that there's a lot of text messaging uh, being employed at uh, Sinai Health Systems, and that women are the primary uh, users of that technology, and that, you know, as, as Neelam alluded, they come ask questions because they've done the research and they're, they're trying to be informed using their smartphones and they're engaging and trying to learn. They want to know what course of action to take. Well, we're not always prepared. We're not always informed. We don't always have the answers. And so, you know, we, we uh, learned that uh, maybe through technology we can help solve some of those problems. But uh, we also learned that there's 10 million women that have either Alzheimer's or dementia, or that they are the care caregiver and caretaker of someone with dementia. That's a pretty staggering number. Uh, and so looking at how to help them is, for an entrepreneur, a great opportunity to, to consider a solution. And so. That's the other uh, piece that this information helps us to look for, opportunities. How do we you know, take advantage of that, that little nugget of wisdom? Uh, uh, was, um, one of our panelists talked about um, brain, male and female brains. They're different. They're different sizes, but there are parts of the brains that are different, like the hippocampus. I don't know what that means, really, at the end stage, but we know there's differences. So it's, it's really up to us to figure out what, where do we take that, how do we move it forward. Your hippocampus is working right now, okay, it's your memory center. It's the memory center of the brain, and we think this is the area of Alzheimer's disease that gets hit. It gets hit initially and continues to get hit over time, but it's different. Hippocampal size is different in men and women. So you can imagine then if things happen, how does that translate out? over time if you have a different size of the hippocampus and, and decline in thinking. So are we saying that we're blaming the hippocampus on the fact that women retain and don't forget? Yeah. And men <laughs> you can, you can We don't know. Out. I think that's the, the that's the question. Um, so a couple other things from the second panel. So we had a panel that was predominantly healthcare and then another one that was law, IT and innovation. And we learned uh, a lot about the, the gender gap, the disparity, that um, very few women are really in a position where they're driving the development of new technologies, um, especially in the medical device industry, which, which Neela mentioned. So why is that important? It's important because if we're not part of the formulation, we'll never be able to solve the equation. In diversity, we know, makes a difference, be it on a board, be it in a a uh, community of uh, think, thinking beings uh, trying to, you know, find the next big uh, opportunity in a, in a medical device or in technology. It, it's proven over and over that the more diverse your community, the better your outcomes are going to be. And, and that's the basic premise. Um, you know, women uh, are clearly always prepared in, in, in the VC community when we're pitching. I've seen uh, women come present to VCs and they'll, they'll bring their data and they'll have every I dotted and T crossed and there's not a question that they can't respond to. So they come prepared. But what do the VCs focus on? That beautiful stiletto heel that that woman is wearing. It's a true story, true story. Uh, so we've got some hurdles, uh, we've got some challenges, and there are differences. And so we have to recognize and embrace those challenges. Another great thing, in addition to, to having all the data and the I's and the T's dotted and crossed, is that when we're running companies, as women in general, we tend to be more, da more capital efficient. So when you're talking about value-based outcomes, when you're talking about the differences of men and women in an organization, we're typically proving to be better managers, more profitable, results-oriented uh, leaders. And so people like uh, the Shark Tank guy, Kevin O'Leary, every one of his investments has, 
has been in women. Is that by accident? I don't think so. So what we're trying to do is really um, understand who we are as women and how we uh, better integrate and maybe elevate our own abilities and our own successes throughout the ecosystem of innovation. Now, it, it might surprise you to know that um, this room reflects exactly what's happening in the uh, legal world, more women graduating than men. But what happens over time is there's attrition. There's attrition that is hurting our particular premise, which is you know, wanting to have a more diverse set of uh, inputs. And if women keep dropping out uh, across the legal field, so never elevate and hit those uh, higher leadership ranks, where they can really prove their value beyond just uh, being part of the team. And I think that's really um, one of the areas that as a, as a legal um, professional, you might want to consider. You know, what is it, what are the hurdles that are going to drop out? But what's even more staggering is the fact that uh, in IP, and for us having uh, women IP attorneys, uh, tends to be uh, few and far between at, at best. And that's typically because as, as STEM-based careers go, uh, having law lawyers with STEM-based careers is, is almost negligible and we're finding that uh, the attrition is exceedingly high. So we want to be able to have a dialogue and a conversation around what's, what's going to change that? How do we change the numbers? And how do we really improve our chances to have a better outcome? More inputs and more diversity is going to produce a better outcome. You know, I was just thinking um, at, the, at this panel, and again, this was really it was really interesting because we had one panel was the healthcare, which was the MD entrepreneurs, myself, MD related, and then we had, as Dima said, the you know the IT, the the lawyers, the everybody involved in this. One comment came about coding. Remember about coding and um, errors, and this this really speaks to this thing about bias. Okay, and you hear a lot about unconscious bias and conscious bias, but. Maybe Dima, yeah. we want to share that story because when I heard it, was I shocked? No, because we've seen this in the music industry, and I can talk to you a little bit about that. But why don't you share about the coding issue? So there was a, a blind study done, or, or a review, a retrospective analysis done of um, anybody familiar with GitHub or any of these uh, code repositories where you can check in your code online. Well, it's it's kind of an open source, uh, community based. I guess, backup storage uh, versioning system. But it's open to all developers and all coders. And so when they analyzed the popularity, I guess, or the um, reviews and adoption of certain code sets, they found that more women's code was being used and adopted and preferred. So what that really indicates is that the more people thought more highly about the code that women generated than men. But the only reason we were able to discern that is because it was a blind review. So, so the net result was that women code better than men, but only when men don't know that it's women. So in these, in these uh, repositories, you pretty much go with some sort of uh, avatar or some sort of a cloaked name so nobody knows the gender and so how do we celebrate our capabilities how do we fight the programmer culture how do we get beyond just being marginalized and and not appreciated in the technology world and it, it's having been in the technology world I can tell you as a woman it's very difficult to break through and and get recognized. Um, it's I think, you know, the other thing about the coding, that when the gender, the sex and gender was revealed for the code, there were way more mistakes knocked off. 
Yeah. Okay. So when it was reintroduced into the experiment, there were a lot more mistakes knocked off on a woman's coding piece than a man's coding piece. Now, again, these are just some illustrations. The, the classical music industry, we've known this, a lot of orchestras for many, many years were predominantly men, okay? Until they started to put the curtain down for uh, blind auditions. And there are multiple stories that have been out there about who has come from blind auditions. Actually, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, has a nice chapter on a nice section on this, and it's true. When blind auditions came in, and you were able to perform behind the curtain, you were picked up, and that's how we started the classical music industry, to give it credit, to give it credit, corrected the issue by just a blind audition. So the coding thing, when I heard it, I said, here we go, it's another analogy again, but it's again an interesting point when you talk about bias. And, and as a physician, here's what I wonder. When you come in to see me, what kind of bias may I have? and looking at you to treat you. And that's something we're trying to instill already in training and when I'm training and mentoring. What are you thinking about this person right now? What information are you pulling in? And is it going to bias what you do, what you say, what you treat with? And if you don't have the data to support it, to say that there are differences or not, then we can get into real big trouble. We can get into a lot of trouble by not doing certain things. So that was, uh, that was the case, yeah. So at the end of the day, women start out great in legal fields and biomedical fields. They're represented fairly well, but we're finding the attrition is, is fairly, uh, you know, uh, acute. And at the end of the day, we need to find ways to, to stay in the game. Because if you're not in the game, you can't even begin to win. If you want to be in a leadership position, you've got to have the tenacity, the, the resilience, and, and figure out how to overcome those, those obstacles. And we want to really facilitate the dialogue that's going to help achieve those goals so that more engineers, more lawyers can stay in the game and be part of the leadership and diversity of culture uh, to, to change the conversation and to change the outcomes. Interestingly enough, Chicago, from a technology standpoint, has more female entrepreneurs than any other city in this country, which is remarkable, but it's a testament to the, the, the commitment that a lot of the organizations like a Miss Tech or Women in Bio or 1871 have now uh, put forward in, in deliberately changing the game. So the good news is, if there's interest, if there's support, if there's intent, if there's conduits of dialogue, we can achieve that. We can make that change happen. Okay, so now what? What's, what does it mean for a device company? What does it mean for a drug company that has not considered sex and gender? That, lots of implications. Lots of implications. I mean, if I were a pharma company, I might be concerned that we might have to redo those studies. We might have to redo all those studies. Now, as a lawyer, you're probably loving that, right? Because now there's tons of business, there's a whole new IP patent, there's research, there's all kinds of things. That's probably not realistic, but at some point, these factors have to be considered. And so going forward with this policy and the triumvirate approach between the NIH, the FDA, and the, the Office of Women's Health, um, we, we have to really uh, recognize this is a serious topic and it's not going to go away anytime soon. So as we, as we conceive new drugs, as we conceive new medical devices, as we conceive new treatment plans or new innovations, we need a new checkbox. We need a new paradigm shift to consider sex, gender, and really beyond that, even more broadly, diversity across the board, ethnicity and cultural mores and other things are gonna to start to filter in because we need to design for a precision individual. Precision medicine really is a, is a way through research, technology, and policies to empower patients, researchers, and providers of, of healthcare together to come to deliver individual care, be it a formulated specific prescription for your body, 
your body chemistry, your body psychology. I mean, we just don't know. There's so many other factors environmentally, in addition to physiologically, that are going to impact how we do things and how we checklist a process to consider those variables. Already we have demonstrated scenarios and stories where this precision medicine has actually come together in an innovation to help in cases of leukemia, to help tailor specific treatments and disease states such as cancer that overcomes what might have been uh, considered because we looked at the individual not just sex and gender, but we looked at the individual. And I think for us, the sex and gender piece is the first step in that conversation. And there are many anecdotal stories and, and um, happy to share more detail with you if, if you'd like. In terms of changing from one size fits all, it requires something called design thinking. It's a, it's a paradigm, it's a way to look at things and, and change your perceptions, clear the biases and innovate around um, many other uh, factors like lifestyle and environmental things. But what's, what's going to make that happen? You might have heard this from uh, Edward Deming, that in God we trust, but all others must bring data. So as Neelam has been saying, data, 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 clinical trials, data, uh, feedback from colleagues at, at conferences, all of that is going to need to come together. We're going to have to start collecting that data. Collecting that data that, that, that uncovers and reveals the things that we haven't really recognized. I think there was a story by Annabelle during our panel that talked about a patient that was getting a, a port uh, for, he, for chemo. Was it a... So, so, Oh, that was a pacemaker? No, she was... Go ahead, tell me about the So, um, the placement of that yeah. port was, was a pacemaker port. And um, so the idea is we have a way of doing things. We do it the same way every time, gender agnostic. And if you apply the same rules, the, and if you don't have a patient that's reading and asking questions, you're going to have the same outcome every time. But this patient was like, hey, doc, can you move this port so that I have a little more discretion and it doesn't show as obviously as, as this invasion in my body does? Can you give me a little sense of, I don't know, um, confidence so I don't, I don't have to disclose that? And, and that the doctor, uh, Dr. Annabelle uh, Bogman, was like, you know, she hadn't even considered the fact that she could place that port somewhere other than where the the patient normally gets it, and give that patient an, a, so a little more. So typically, pacers, when you place them, they're very visible, and this this patient does a lot of, you know, entertaining. She wears a lot of gowns that have that are basically bareback gowns. So she asked, can we have a pacer placed underneath my breast? Can we place it there? And you remember Annabelle said very yeah. candidly. Had you thought of it? She goes, I don't know, I guess you could. And that's kind of the answer that we have. I guess, why not? But we don't know data to suggest if you place a pacer someplace else outside where it's traditionally placed, is it going to lose its effectiveness in pacing your heart? And these are the kinds of questions that, where did it come from? It came from, as I say, the field, it came from the patient. And we need to be able to respond to these questions. And she even looked at, she looked at me and I looked at her and I said, I'm a neurologist, why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those things, right? Exactly. It's just, an aha moment right? that, that from an innovation standpoint, wasn't even thought about, wasn't even filtered, probably didn't even take into account those, those subjects to even do a, a, a focus group to say, wow, that's an important consideration because we're not thinking like that. We're not design thinking. 
And I like to call it precision design thinking because if we're, we're really thinking in those precise terms, we're including variables outside of our normal traditional product development uh, process. So we've got to go get those, those data points. We've got to get those stories. We've got to hear from the field where the intersections are or where the uh, di diversity is or, or uh, disconnects are. Um, so as we learn more from the field, we can then evaluate and put together maybe a more thorough process in how we build, how we find those deltas, how we find those gaps, and help formulate and rem remedy those opportunities. Now what, what could that conceivably look like? The scale and scope of some of that could be anything from custom design instrumentations for your surgeon. Had you thought about the fact that every instrument is designed for the average man? Have you thought about that there are maybe some surgeons that have smaller hands or a female or non-female? I mean, gender agnostic, but the size in this case could matter. And if we are able to innovate at a customized level, we've got opportunities to really improve not only patient outcomes, but the user experience of the surgeon. And I think that's really where we have the opportunity and the responsibility to think uh, differently. So device designs, uh, we could think about improving the placement, as, as we talked about with the, the port, uh, improving either, either aesthetic, functional, or uh, just logical ideas. And when you think about things and when you innovate from a design thinking standpoint and you're looking at factors around gender, you have an opportunity to empathize and put yourself in the shoes of that patient, to, to think about the user, the user experience more broadly in each use case, be it a, a heart um, pacemaker or a breast uh, feeding piece of clothing, a dress or something other than that, or shoes that, that operate a certain way to help uh, a prosthetic device be acclimated. You know, but the, the, the point is if, if, if not um, considering those factors, we'll likely miss a tremendous number of opportunities and um, having the NIH policy and the other things kind of driving and forcing us to, to do that, I think will we'll create a more diverse set of inputs that will, without question, not only give us a more diverse set of outputs, but those solutions that we create um, could, could easily come back and allow us to modularize things allow us to do iterations of design in a, in a way that leverages parametric modeling, which is, is one of the most efficient things about product design in and of itself today, that we have um, the power and the access to reach, which gives us variations on a theme, and those variations on a theme are gonna address or match up to um, individual custom sizes of clothing, shoes, hats, skull caps, uh, all kinds of product designs that you know, may marginally uh, work if traditionally designed, but perfectly fit and solve if considered with a design mind side. So the, the, the bottom line is we need that larger feedback. We need to consider things because here's an example. Um, somebody thought that a woman didn't like the way a cell phone worked. So the traditional cell phone um, is your standard rect rectangle, subject A. Um, and, and so they're looking at, and obviously they've, they've thought about this a lot, but they thought, you know, this is like a compact, and, a, and women don't like to stick these in their pockets, or maybe they don't have pockets. So, so how do we 
we create this circular smartphone that might better overcome struggles and object, uh, uh, kind of obstacles that women uh, who hate rectangular phones don't like. Uh, so in, in design thinking, you're looking for solutions, and this is a fairly simplistic one, but you know, sometimes you're solving problems you don't even know exist. Sometimes um, you learn about things along the way that are kind of fun and funny. But um, I, I think it's invariably about taking the large inputs. And um, the more diverse, the more broad. Um, and and for, for what we're doing, we're really going to focus on the sex and gender piece, trying to get ourselves better informed as a community, as a whole, and uh, bringing more experts to the table. So um, with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to me. So, you know, as I was listening to Dima, so we can go back a little bit to devices. Let's talk about devices. And I just came back from a meeting and uh, had a great opportunity to do talk with other women physicians um, at this meeting and sitting next to an orthopedic surgeon, woman orthopedic surgeon, and she was just going through a list of all the sex and gender differences in the musculoskeletal system between men and women when it comes to bones, muscles, insertions, all these things. I don't want to get too medical here, but I mean, honestly, she went down the list. And I said to her, I said, you know, she was talking about arthritis and the impact of arthritis um, as people get older. I said to her, talk to me about devices, or talk to me when you put in a hip, or when you put in a knee joint, and you're putting in, frank, frankly, you know, just a, a very mechanical piece of equipment, what sex and gender considerations have been looked at in the device field? And she said almost nil. So we're talking, and I said to her, I said, you know, outside of, again, downsizing it for a woman's frame, has anyone ever looked at, if you put in a hip, how is the, or the tissue around it, how is that reacting to the hip placement? Knowing that, depending on the age, where, where are we with our estrogen? Where are we with our hormones? Hormones influence tissue. Lack of or more of influence tissue. It influences size of muscles. It influences all these things. And she said, you know what? There's very, very little data to look at hips or to take a look at the, the tissue around the hip. How is it reacting? Is it developing in an inflammatory response? Is that the reason why sometimes hips take, sometimes they don't? All these things, again, I'm putting it out there for you to think about this because we are so busy doing, we're not thinking about implications. And when a procedure fails, or when there's a poor outcome, we attribute it to other things, but we're not even looking at the device. How are we making our devices? What kind of metal science is coming in? What kind of materials are being used in, in the body? And these are, this is a whole area now that's really being looked into here. What kind of metals and what kind of materials are we going to be putting in bodies? Plastic versus metal versus things that degrade in the body. How is that affecting the tissue around and is it sex and gender based? Okay. So again, thinking about that and that's what we're talking about devices and, and really and even with the pacers. How are we making pacers now? Brain. How are, we, how are we doing deep brain stimulation? What are we putting in brain? Is it one size fits all? Really? Well, you know, maybe we should be thinking about looking at case studies where we have this uh, women and, and men and differences and looking at outcomes based through that lens. So, a little bit long-winded on that, but I just want to, as I was sitting here listening to Dima, this is what I was thinking about. So how do we get there from all these things that we presented to you this morning? How do we get to our, to our goal? Well, a couple of things. Moving the needle. I like the slide being, and, and, and Dima made this slide, and I really am happy that she put sponsorship before mentorship. I really believe in sponsorship. I think we mentor way too much. I think mentorship is important, but we need sponsorship. So what is sponsorship? 
sponsorship basically is empowering people to take this knowledge and to go with it, frankly. Sponsoring someone to say, you need to take this and you need to now present this somewhere else. Mentorship is collecting the data, getting some guidance, etc. But we need to move here in order to get, and then you can mentor along the way, but sponsorship leads to championship. This is where we are right now in this area of sex and gender, medicine, healthcare, etc. We are in this part. We have totally exhausted that part. We have some of this data. We need to know where the gaps are, where to figure it out. The only way we're going to do it is if we do sponsorship to championship to move this, and this is where we're headed right now. Key challenges. Based on the history, based on the iGiant experience, based on what we're getting from our panel that came to, to sit with us, it was very eye-opening. I know the audience at Matter was like, wow, we just had no idea about these issues. Here's what we've identified. We have a pipeline issue, and we, you know, everywhere there's a pipeline issue, it seems, and everywhere there's a leaky pipeline where people are just dropping out. And you know, it, you have to come to a point where you're like, okay, we know there's a leaky pipeline. Step, what are we doing to prevent the leak? Okay. And one of the things is the medical schools and the research institutions have to get on board. And they have to get on board and embrace this in a big way to say, you know what, we, we're seeing these big shifts. There are tremendous shifts going on right now in trying to get medical school education up to speed, if you will, with all of the innovation technology that is coming around the medical school and around the research institutions. And it's a slow process. But there are different ways you can get things through, if you will, through different groups, different clinics, et cetera, to try this. By the way, the community is driving this. So for example, text messaging. Text messaging. When we were talking about text messaging patients, oh, well, you know, that's all these, the HIPAA, this and that, and you can't do this, and what's coming through a text message. Patients are text messaging constantly. They're constantly text messaging each other. There are chat sessions now on a lot of diseases where people are coming on. They're texting each other, where do I need to go to get this and, and what information is being used. One area that you want to know where text messaging has really, really taken off, it's in the global arena. I say this all the time. We need to be looking at global health and bring it local. Not local, global. I'm talking the other way. Global and bring it local. Because what's going on in global health is incredible about how people are being reached in countries and villages. Amazing distances are being covered and health is being delivered. And so global health has really revolutionized text messaging and the use of text messaging, okay? The other thing here we have to think about, lack of data. Now, as Dima mentioned, I deal with data all day long. I like data, but here's the thing. It's only as good as what goes in, and you know that. If you don't collect good data, it doesn't matter what comes out because it wasn't good coming in. We are having a real struggle right now in trying to collect data. We have almost gone to the extreme where we're collecting everything on everybody all the time, and that is not telling us really informing a lot. We have to figure out a nice managing system here of how much data and what do we need to make decisions, okay? Because right now the pendulum is collect everything, and that's not helping. That makes things very muddled, and that things, again, I'm a neurologist. I like things structured. I like things clarity as much as I can, based on the nervous system. But when you have too much of this, it just is too much static. So we have to figure out what data do we need, what data is going to help us get to a sex and gender difference if we need to do it, and then sit back and step away, and then figure out how we're going to analyze this and why are we analyzing the data, and for what outcome. And then of course you heard me talk about the mentoring sponsorship issue. We have to start at the bench, we have to start clinical, and then we have to go to innovation. I, cannot, I do not see any other way of trying to bridge what's happening in medicine, in the general population, and then in medicine without linking to innovative technologies, and, and engineers, lawyers, everyone. There has to be a multidisciplinary approach to these issues. Because if we don't, we're really, really setting ourselves up for a lot of problems down the road. We are going to be even more siloed than we are now. And we are very siloed right now. Very, very siloed right now in trying to communicate across disciplines. Um, I have an 
opportunity to listen to a very, just a really impressive physician um, in Canada who basically said he is a CEO of a hospital system in Ontario. And he, fascinating, he's an astronaut, he's an MD, he's an astronaut. He was the first MD astronaut in space, space station. He's an aquanaut, which means he was underwater doing experiments for like almost a year, underwater, in an underwater station. And he's now a CEO of a health system. And I was listening to him, and he made a comment that I thought was just exactly right on, spot on. He says the only way that we're going to be able to deal with personalized medicine and health care is if the MDs Right, sit right next door to the engineers and the innovators in their space. So when I come out of a room and seeing a patient and I have an idea about something, I'm not looking for the guy, and the guy's not looking for me, he's right there. Come in here, see, the, see what happened here? Can you tell me how, how can you fix this? What do you think we can do for this either radiological picture? That's the only way, and he is designing his healthcare system with his hospital in, in, in outside of Toronto. He is putting them right next to each other. We are not going to the innovative part. We are not going to the engineering school. The engineering school people are sitting in the clinic where the patients are and seeing how the technology flows and seeing how that happens. And I think that's the only way when you're physically on the space that you're going to get. And you have to physically be on the space to see what people use, what people need, and that's where the ideas are going to come. So in conclusion, a couple things. We are at risk of misunderstanding human physiology if we do not start really moving on the sex and gender considerations. We are at huge risks right now. Sex, sex bias factors cause sex bias in gene expression through the genome. So there are things with the genes. One thing to know about genes, you all have genes, we all have genes. Genes can get upregulated, they can get downregulated. The environment plays a huge role in a lot of your genes whether your genes are expressed or not. So the idea that it's in my genes, that's just the way it is, yes. In certain cases, yes. But I'm going to put this forward to you for your own health. It's your environment that you are around that can up or down regulate. Your lifestyle can up or down regulate your genes. And that should be very, very encouraging to you when it comes to health. Researchers have to con consider the impact of sex and gender and the interpretation of results and it, it really extends, the sex and gender concept extends far beyond reproductive health. Sex and gender is not all about, as we say in the field, bikini medicine. It's not bikini medicine, which means women's health. This is, extends far greater than that. So I'm hoping with today's presentation that you begin to think about these things, see how they can interact, and we're we'll looking forward to some questions right now. So thank you for your attention. Wendy Epstein, I'm the faculty director of the Harris Health Law Institute here at DePaul. And my role here is very modest. It is to uh, facilitate all of you all asking some questions of our fabulous panelists. I also have questions that were pre-submitted by the students who so fabulously planned this panel. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to kick it off with one of the student questions and then I'll open it up for questions to the audience more generally. Um, so you both made such a powerful case that um, research and innovation in healthcare more generally need to consider gender issues and that more work needs to be done in this area. And we noticed that your slide on challenges to um, facilitating this research being done and this innovation being done uh, was mostly focused on social norms and the, the difficulties there. But because we're at a law school, we wonder about the role of the law in facilitating this sort of work and this sort of innovation. So, and, and you also mentioned that the NIH and the FDA, through some of their 